second talk in the series. Today, John is um, the uh, um, museum specialist in the Division of Animals in the Department of Earth Zoology. And one of his main specialties is um, the Marine Animal Collection. Um, and so he's going to give uh, a second talk in the series today on Remington Kellogg. He's actually going to be retiring at the end of the week. So it's the end of next week. End of next week. So this is his swan song. So uh, without further ado, yeah. Okay. Here's the process. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, this, so this is a talk that's part um, um, uh, biography of. Catalog and part about this amazing collection of baleen that we got that he brought into the museum and part about his swan song when he retired. So uh, we'll start. So you... Okay, okay. No, yeah, yeah, I, I was. I was Okay, good. Uh, part one, biography. Uh, uh, it's early life. Uh, Arthur Remington Kellogg was born in Davenport, Iowa in 1892. He wasn't fond of his first name, so he dropped it and went by Remington. He grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, shown here. Uh, as a boy, he loved to collect and prepare uh, natural history specimens. Uh, Kellogg wanted to attend a university with substantial natural history collections and which encouraged collection-based research. The University of Kansas was an incubator of great naturalists, including Louis Dyke, uh, seen here, uh, who did great taxidermy work for the Smithsonian before returning to Kansas to build a natural history museum at uh, the University of Kansas. Uh, Kellogg first studied uh, entomology and then switched to mammalogy. He taught ornithology as an undergraduate when he uh, filled in for an instructor who died. Uh, uh, he retained his broad interest in natural history throughout his career. He earned his BA in 1915 and his master's in 1916, and he began field work with the U.S. Biological Survey in uh, 1915. Uh, his doctoral program. Well, Kellogg began doctoral work at the University of California, Berkeley in 1918, uh, which of course uh, also was a, has a great natural history collection. He worked under the great paleontologist and conservationist John C. Merriam. He published an expansive work on fossil pinnipeds, as well as a monograph on Microtus californicus. Uh, this is a California bowl from our collection, uh, which uh, Kellogg collected. Um, Kellogg's graduate work was interrupted by World War I. He served in France in the medical department laboratory. One of his main duties was trapping rats in the trenches and the base ports. Fortunately for Kellogg, his commanding officer was an ardent naturalist and allowed him to collect specimens other than rats. Uh, and here are some of the specimens uh, that he collected in France. Uh, on the left are wood mice, and on the right are European fallow deer. So these are also in our collection. Uh, his he returned to Berkeley in 1919 and married fellow student Marguerite Henrik, who eventually became the first recipient of the Smithsonian Benefactor Award. Uh, they set up home in Washington, D.C. Uh, Kellogg worked for the U.S. Biological Survey from 1920 to 1928, mostly on owls and hawks, but also on amphibians and reptiles and mammals. Uh, some of his northern pocket gophers are on the left. 
On the right, he's seen preparing uh, snakes. He went to uh, North Carolina with the U.S. Biological Survey to collect some dolphin specimens from the shore fishery run by the Nye Oil Company. Uh, he attempted a sort of grisly experiment in which he had the cranium of a couple dolphins opened up so that the brain was exposed. He then introduced electrodes and was hoping to stimulate the dolphin in various ways to see what it would excite the electrodes. Unfortunately, the dolphins pretty much went into immediate shock and died, so that experiment was a failure. Uh, I'm including this picture of him in Joshua Tree National Monument, uh, not because I know anything about really what he did there, but because there are so few pictures of Kellogg, and I wanted to show this one. And so this is him in a unique uh, location. Uh, so after John C. Merriam was appointed president of the Carnegie Institution of Washington, he lined up grants for Kellogg, which allowed uh, him to conduct research into marine mammals and collect fossils. Uh, he completed his PhD in 1928 with his seminal work, History of Whales, Their Adaptation to Life in the Water, an excellent account of the adaptive changes which occurred as the terrestrial ancestors of whales evolved into fully aquatic mammals. Uh, this work holds up very well and is still often cited. Echolocation, however, was unknown at this time and so was not treated here. And Kellogg surmised that the dolphin melon was a fat repository. Uh, on the left is Kellogg uh, fossil hunting at Calvert Cliffs in Maryland. And on the right in uh, this time period in uh, 1929 with David Starr Jordan. And so uh, one of the things he did was collect the holotype of Pelocetus calvertensis in 1929. Here they have uh, a boat in the uh, uh, shallows of where they carted it up and then uh, hauled it off. And, and on the uh, right, that is the actual specimen. Um, the work resulted in uh, Kellogg's publication, a review of the Archaeocetae, which is literally the ancient whales, uh, in 1936. A another great work. Uh, in the late 1920s, Kellogg helped found the Council for Conservation of Whales, the first organization in the world exclusively devoted to saving the whales. Uh, there was a very successful campaign to place stories in newspapers and magazines to bring greater public awareness to whales and the threats to their populations. And um, this culminated in the uh, Ge National Geographic 1940 January issue uh, in which uh, he um, partnered with Elsie Bosselman, an illustrator, uh, to uh, de describe whales, their natural behaviors, and the threats to their population uh, uh, in an honest and forthright manner, uh, in both words and in illustrations and photographs. And so these are uh, some of uh, Bosselman's uh, uh, illustrations. And if you saw my talk on Frederick True, you know that previous to this, especially in newspapers and media, there was a lot of sort of mythology of whales that was presented. And this was a break from that, really presenting whales as normal mammals, doing normal natural behaviors, and uh, presenting the threats to their population. So on the left, we see a sperm whale uh, it, enraged from uh, being harpooned. Uh, in the, in the, the middle, uh, we see uh, right whales, and on the right, uh, gray whales frolicking near shore. Uh, here's a blue whale with a uh, ship with an industrial harpoon sort of sneaking up behind it from an iceberg. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, a, a right whale with a calf alongside it and underneath it, a, a, a pygmy right whale. I don't know if they really associate it in real life, but they do in this illustration. 
Um, and then on the uh, right of Bowhead, again, uh, being attacked by uh, 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 native subsistence hunters. Uh, here are uh, a mass stranding of pilot whales, again, being chased by uh, men in small boats with harpoons. Uh, this is an illustrate. Now, Rizos dolphins, which are Grampus grisius, um, you know, have generally have scrape marks on them. Uh, and uh, Kellogg surmised that it was due to attack by giant squid. But in actuality, it's uh, due to uh, attacks from conspecifics. They're not very nice to each other. Uh, at narwhals and, uh, and then um, spotted dolphins on the right, uh, showing a lot of their uh, natural behaviors, diving and so forth. And then uh, again, uh, the uh, uh, fishery in North Carolina where uh, dolphins were being harvested for head oils, which were used for fine applications like watches and sewing machines. Um, getting back to Kellogg's career here. Uh, Kellogg uh, was appointed assistant curator of mammals under Garrett Miller in uh, 1928, the same year he published his dissertation, uh, History of Whales, Their Adaptation to Life in the Water. And then he became curator of mammals in 1941. He was appointed director of the National Museum of Natural History in 1948 and became assistant secretary of the Smithsonian in 1958. Uh, so he moved into the higher echelons of the institution's administration. Uh, during this time, he did field work for mammals. Uh, here he is in Huntington, West Virginia in 1936. Uh, this is the uh, Rampart Cave Expedition. Uh, so here he was actually going after fossils in a cave. Uh, here he's seen uh, with uh, one of our dioramas on the rhinos. And here he is with Leonard Steiniger in the uh, Hall of Marine Life, uh, which uh, was uh, a uh, hall on the second floor west of the Natural History Museum that uh, True had curated but never lived to see. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the uh, model of the blue whale that was collected at Belena Station. Uh, of, of, the uh, whale that was collected at Belena Station in Newfoundland. Um, and uh, Kellogg is just showing this off to Leonard Steiniger. Uh, and this is the blue whale. And uh, this is in the Hall of Marine Life. And uh, it's kind of curious. This, this appeared in that National Geographic article that I uh, was showing you earlier with the uh, watercolors. And uh, in the caption, um, uh, Kellogg uh, states that uh, this whale was three years old. Uh, this was a 75 foot blue whale, not likely to be three years old, but I, you know, much older. Uh, but I think it just goes to show that even someone like Kellogg, probably the world's greatest expert at this time on whales, still had. Uh, you know, a lot of missing information about, you know, what was going on on the life history of these whales. But he thought they were R selected, you know, basically they, 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 they had short lives, they grew quickly and they had lots of babies. And in truth, they're much, they're really the opposite. Uh, he was very concerned about the factory whaling ship slaughter at this time. Uh, the whales, the, uh, the oceans were being decimated. And uh, the purpose of uh, harvesting the whales was, well, the number one reason was uh, producing margarine. Once they got the oily, t uh, the uh, fishy taste out of the oil, uh, and could make margarine out of it, that really boomed. But they also made soap, 
They make glycerin for uh, uh, militaries to produce explosives. So there was a number of products that were produced. Uh, all could be produced by other means. Uh, so uh, uh, it became uh, really tried to do things to uh, uh, pretty, you know contain the problem. And uh, what he did was he joined the uh, del he became a delegate to the League of Nations conference on whaling, and then a delegate to another conference on whaling in London in 1937, and the head of the U.S. delegation of the International Whaling Commission uh, later on in uh, 49, uh, trying desperately to uh, use his diplomatic uh, skills to uh, rein in international whaling. Uh, in fact, he devoted so much of his time to it, he really, from this point in his career on, really stopped doing research until he retired. And uh, here is a picture of uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the signing of the uh, commencement of the International Whaling Commission. Um, Kellogg brought scientific rigor to the analysis of worldwide whaling numbers, but was unable to overcome the inertia of the tragedy of the commons among the whaling nations. With trust minimal and every whaling nation out for itself, the IWC was a failure in Kellogg's time. He devoted 35 years of his life to a cause which disappointed him greatly. Kellogg honestly believed in the power to persuade through science, but was unable to do so. But his legacy was that his scientific argument was forcefully injected into the debate. And uh, this was in the archives, it's a uh, uh, part of his passport. So he really traveled a a around a lot, uh, doing these diplomatic efforts, and it meant a lot to him, even if he was really not happy with the results. Uh, at the, at, after he retired in 1962, he became an honorary curator in paleobiology and uh, published a great deal, a, a massive amount in his retirement, including this, the fossil marine mammals from the Miocene Calvert Formation of Maryland and Virginia. Uh, he left behind a treasure trove of slides, which are really cool. And this is some of them. Okay, now I want to move on to uh, the second part of this talk, which is uh, the discussion of this Antarctic baleen collection that we have right over nearby in pod two that was collected from first post-World War II Japan. Um, in uh, 1945, uh, it is well known that the U.S. dropped atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, seen here. Uh, what is less well known is that 75 of the largest cities in Japan were firebombed. The widespread use of combustible construction materials helped create deadly firestorms in the city. Much of the infrastructure of Japan was in ruins. Food production had plummeted, and the need to secure agricultural land for its people was one of the prime reasons the empire put forward to invade China. But now the Japanese people faced starvation. The U.S. was already overcommitted to aiding Europe, and there was little appetite to come to Japan's aid. And uh, here we see uh, some, of, some of the results of that destruction. Uh, in 1945, uh, Japan surrendered. Uh, General MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur became Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers upon Japan's surrender in 1945. He was keenly interested in securing Japan as an ally. And so feeding the population became a top priority. To that end, MacArthur had two military oil tankers which had survived the war, the Hashidari Maru and the Nishan Maru, converted into factory whaling ships to take blue and fin whales in the Antarctic to feed the desperate population. 
The ship's crews were mostly young men who had not seen military service and presumably would not harbor as deep an animosity to the occupying powers. They harvested over 2,400 whales over two years and became national heroes in Japan. Uh, but the Pacific allies of the United States voiced strong objections. While these ships uh, only armed with industrial harpoons and flensing knives hardly posed a military threat, Australia and New Zealand insisted that they remain at least 100 miles off their coastlines. But also there was a widespread perception that Japan had little regard for international rules and regulations regarding whaling before the war and simply could not be trusted. Kellogg placed a number of diplomatic cables in the archives which covered this topic. Although uh, the US came out of the war as the unquestioned power in the Pacific, the Allies' concerns needed to be treated with respect. Nonetheless, MacArthur could pretty much do as he pleased. He sent out the Hashidati Maru and Nishan Maru to the Antarctic to hunt whales in uh, the 1946-47 season and again in 1947-48. Uh, uh, Kellogg used his position as the US chief whaling diplomat uh, to make requests of these expeditions. Uh, Kellogg requested that more freezers be installed on board to prevent spoilage. The request was denied. Salt was used, even though it made much of the meat unpalatable. Uh, it was much cheaper and required less space. Kellogg also requested that whales too small to be legally taken be tagged for allometry studies when they were harvested in the future. Again, getting back to how little we knew about how these animals developed and grew and how long they lived. That was just unknown at that time. Uh, and uh, Kellogg's, that, that was also denied. Uh, Kellogg's third request was to collect the largest plate of baleen from each side of the animal to use in an aging study. Uh, this request was granted. Uh, and here we see uh, in this uh, slide uh, the whalers extracting the baleen from a whale's palate on the Hashidati Maru. In all, they collected uh, 1,625 plates of blue and fin whales, uh, uh, or, or I'm sorry, 3,250 plates uh, from uh, 1,625 blue and fin whales uh, and uh, shipped them to the Smithsonian. In order to assuage uh, the ally observers, uh, uh, the Allies, observers were placed on the ships to monitor the operations. Uh, the Australian observer, Kenneth Coonan, was a keen scientific naturalist and made detailed reports on weather, direction of ocean currents, species richness, and density of plankton, salinity, temperature at several depths. When combined with shipboard data on the collection of whales, including total length, degree of ossification of the vertebral columns, stomach contents, sex and reproductive status, the total amount of scientific information collected was truly impressive. Uh, Kunin was also collecting information that would uh, assist Australia in jumpstarting its own whaling operations. Uh, in contrast, the American observer, David McCracken, who wrote a book about his uh, uh, time on these boats, uh, was something of a buffoon and uh, what often allowed the Japanese crew to break the rules, which infuriated the allies, although General MacArthur really didn't care. <laughs> uh, but after receiving the first shipment, Kellogg soon realized that there were not enough annuli in the baleen plates to actually age them. At most, the largest plates had seven years of growth. He thought that he had made a truly embarrassing mistake and attempted to prevent the second year of collecting, but it was too late. And uh, he received shipments for both years anyway. But he did not want to be associated with it, and the collection fell into neglect and uh, wound up in storage at the torpedo factory in Alexandra, which was not used after the war 
and became a Smithsonian storage space. It's now an art center on the Alexandria waterfront, and it's really cool. You should visit it. Um, in the mid 1990s, the collection was rediscovered by the uh, Edmund H. Marine Mammal Program, but the origin of the collection was unknown. Around 2007, the collection was packaged up and moved to the Smithsonian Support Center. But since no data was associated with the collection, there was debate about its value and whether it should be kept, and there were advocates for destroying this collection. Uh, the only clue was that tags on the baleen had Japanese characters. In 2007, I was asked to investigate Smithsonian archives to see if I could find anything related to this collection. I was able to locate this letter relayed from Kellogg to the Supreme Commander of the Allied Powers in Japan requesting the baleen plates. This was a thread that I pulled on, which led to a cascade of information from the archives. Uh, and Robert Brownell secured the manifest of the Hashidani Maru and the Nishan Maru from Japan. Uh, and these were inscribed on Excel data sheets by uh, uh, curator Jim Mead. But there was still a major problem. Uh, each year, each ship began their whale catalog with serial number one. And since the plates from the Hashidati Maru were all mixed together, matching the plates to the data sheets seemed nearly hopeless. So we embarked on a project to photograph all of the plates from the two expeditions of the Hashidati Maru to see if we could sort them digitally. Uh, Paula Pohaska was our technician who spent many long hours over the course of a year uh, to photograph the plates. The tags and writing on the plates involved a lot of different styles and colors and English characters, as well as uh, Japanese. It was unknown if this gambit would work, but it turned out that even though the colors and styles of markings changed over the course of the expeditions, the digital sorting worked much better than we hoped, and nearly all of the baleen became associated with a wealth of data. Paula went on to incorporate these images in two catalog books for easy reference when using the collection, which are now in pod two. Uh, now, uh, the Japanese Antarctic Baleen Collection, far from being an embarrassment, is an extremely important NMNH marine mammal research collection with a number of labs collaborating to reveal new life history information about blue whales and fin whales. And uh, some of the people that we have working on it from left to right, uh, Ali Fleming, Michael McGowan, uh, uh, Christy West, and uh, Kathleen Hunt. But there's more. Uh, and uh, what we're finding in our sampling and analysis. Okay, so first off, things you can extract from uh, the baleen plate. DNA uh, for population genetics, uh, stable isotopes. Uh, you uh, can tell if there's been change in prey or ocean location. Hormones, are they, were they pregnant or stressed? And toxins. And as you see on the, this baleen plate, what they did was they sampled about every centimeter here down the length of the plate. And since uh, it's always growing, uh, and these, this plate may have, may have had five or six years of growth in it, what you get is the life history information of the five or six years of that animal before it died. So you can tell in here where it might've been pregnant or stressed or went to a different ocean or uh, you know picked up toxins. All of these things are, are in, the, in, in the baleen. So it's magnificent uh, research material. And since we have such a huge data set that will never be matched again, it's just a priceless collection. Uh, and, you know, and one of the things I wanna point out is new information is that, uh, you know, one of the things that came through in the baleen is that there's a significant sort of non-migratory blue whale population that sort of hangs out in the Antarctic Ocean. And uh, it's, it was always assumed previously that they went to warmer water, 
when things got cold. But uh, you know what we're seeing from the baleen is that's probably not true. And uh, we just didn't know that. So we are discovering new information. This plate is uh, uh, just an interesting anthropological artifact. Uh, one of the seamen uh, did some artwork on a plate. And uh, here we have uh, a whale and uh, one of the catcher boats. I really like that plate. Uh, now, uh, into part three of uh, our talk, uh, the, the dedication of the Blue Whale exhibit in the Life in the Sea Hall uh, Natural History Museum in 1963. And here's Kellogg, and here's the Blue Whale. And I have this, and I want to read it. Um, it's a uh, it's not exactly his dedication speech, but in the archives, there's uh, a, a lot of notes that he made about the speech. And in the newspapers, there was quotes from the speech. And I tried to put that together. This is all verbatim words from Kellogg, although the speech he actually gave was probably longer and probably was not exactly like this. This is all uh, Kellogg's words. And I, and, and I wanna read this. Uh, for more than 1,000 years, people have been known to hunt whales. The whale industry was organized at first in accordance with local needs. The chase, however, was prosecuted each year as energetically as the available equipment would permit. The historic records that begin more than 400 years ago show that at first, there was a period of rapid development. The whaling boats and vessels increased rapidly in numbers and relatively large profits were made. This was followed by an equally rapid decline owing to the increasing scarcity of the quarry. From the 9th until the 16th century, whaling operations were directed essentially towards one species, the Biscay or Northern right whale. Then in the early 17th century came the first expansion of the industry, when Arctic bowheads were exploited. In the course of 110 years, the records indicate the Dutch fleet alone marketed the whalebone and oil of some 100,000 whales, and whalebone being baleen. Uh, sperm whales, which once existed in vast numbers in subtropical ocean waters, no longer constitute the basis of a pelagic industry although somewhat desultory operations continue. Uh, the northern right whale and the bowhead were reduced in numbers almost to the point of extinction in the North Atlantic. Year after year, whaling has taken a toll in excess of the rate of reproduction. And the stocks of one species after another have been depleted. In no instance has the stock of species so depleted ever regained its former abundance. The blue whale is the largest mammal existing today and probably the largest that has ever lived. Blue whales are found from polar waters to temperate seas and occasionally even at the equator. The blue whale calf at birth may be as much as 26 feet long. It is nursed for about seven months and is weaned when it is, has attained a length of 50 feet. Again, this information is dated and it was his best information at the time. Full grown, it may attain a length of 100 feet and weigh 150 tons. Uh, the lifespan of the blue whale apparently does not exceed 25 years, although again, that's dated information. Uh, we are now observing the closing days of the existence of the blue whale in our oceans. Indeed, some of you at this opening may never again have the opportunity to see a real blue whale except in museums. It seemed ironic, millions of years ago, the ancestors of the great blue whale lived on land and then adapted to the sea, but taking to the water, it meant, met a relentless killer, man. Granting that the present scale of Killing continues. In the not too distant future, the visitor can come here to get a fairly accurate impression of the external 
appearance of the blue whale, the largest mammal known to have existed on Earth. I like this shot. Uh, this is the same blue whale uh, when uh, the uh, ocean, uh, the life in the sea had been stripped and it was the last thing remaining, sort of a lonely wandering whale uh, lost in the uh, bowels of the museum. And this is a cartoon by Roxy Claiborne, which sort of encapsulates uh, Kellogg's life from 1928 to uh, 1962. So at the top, we see Kellogg in his early career. He's studying whales. The whale is happy to be having Kellogg study it. And then uh, Kellogg in the second scene, uh, he's a diplomat. He's working on saving the whales. He's not paying attention to the research. And uh, then when he retires at the end of the, his career, the whale and Kellogg are reunited and research happens again and everybody's happy. Uh, and, and here's something interesting from the archives. So this guy, uh, uh, Westwood, sent in a uh, letter asking uh, Kellogg, uh, could a killer whale be the whale that swallowed Jonah? And uh, now I'll, I don't have an answer in the archives, but he did answer it in that National Geographic article. And this is basically what he said. Yes, Jonah would fit inside of a killer whale. However, the uh, vicious teeth at the front end would probably rip him to shreds to start with and powerful uh, gastric uh, juices would make quick work of him and dissolve them into nothing. And thus, uh, he would not exit here, but instead here. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, biographers of uh, Kellogg, who I got a lot of the information from, uh, Frank Whitmore and D. Graham Burnett. Uh, the Sounding of the Whale by D. Graham Burnett is a great book on the history of uh, whale science in the 20th century, whale science and conservation. And it's just a, a really wonderful book, even if it's really thick. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Let's see if they, in the chat, if there's any questions. Okay, we're gonna get to the chat. Oh, all right. No questions. No questions. Okay. No questions from the audience here. None. Okay. Well, uh, then thank you very much, and we'll re we'll uh, post this talk online. Thank you. These chats. Oh, another one popped up. These chats up there. Oh, there's a chat. Yeah, you need to go up there. Chat. Oh, here we go. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, there is a question. No, there's no questions. I think about that. Oh, how do you link the baleen? Yeah, scroll up. There is. John, how do you link the baleen to the records? Are they listening to me? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, how do you link the baleen to the records? So. Uh, the, the, the main way was it's easy to tell fin whale and blue whale apart. Uh, the baleen is, is, is considerably different. The uh, blue whale is really dark baleen with dark uh, fringe on it. And uh, the fin whale generally has a lot of lighter areas in it. And it should really, they're very distinct. And so what we we're really looking for was if we put all of our uh, you know, what we think are the numbers going in order because they seem to line up. And even with they, they change over time during the course of an expedition, they're still lining up in that series. And then we look at the ship manifest and we see if the ship manifest matches the same species 
uh, order for the same serial numbers, then we then then we became confident we had a match. And then you can go further, and uh, you know when they sample the baleen, you can tell if you got a female or a male often, you know if it was pregnant or that, and so you can further confirm uh, that we were on right. Now there was about a hundred plates that I could not. Uh, that, that were collected very late in the year and had multiple serial numbers on them and something went haywire and we just couldn't match them up. But out of that many thousand plates, so, uh, you know, 3,000 something, having only 100 that we couldn't match up was pretty good. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Uh, of course. Oh, climate controlled storage. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, you know, I am a big believer in climate controlled storage. Uh, and, uh, you know, having visited some of the museums in Europe where they do not have climate controlled uh, storage for whale collections, they have a lot of problems. And, uh, I, 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 you know, I think uh, that uh, it does uh, keep them, you know, the, you know, there was a lot of problems uh, with mold on some of these plates. Uh, it, as I said earlier, they were neglected. Uh, you know, they were considered to be an embarrassment, so they weren't really treated in the, with the way they probably should have been. Uh, and uh, it's also a problem with uh, osteology collections of whales because there can be a lot of deep embedded grease. And if you have air conditioning, you know, it can stay in the bone. But if, you know, you go through the summer and it gets hot and humid, and that, that, that oil starts to liquefy and ooze out of the bone, which it does, you know, then you create a mass, you attract pest, you know, and uh, we really don't have as much of that problem in our air conditioned collections. Uh, so yes, I think air conditioning is very important. Uh, anything else? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Now we are going to just uh... Can you go out of the way? Sorry. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 